good morning. Welcome to Sycamore Creek Church and our online worship service. My name is Kevin. I'm the worship leader. Really glad that you are joining us for worship as we continue this series, People of the Light. Um, we are going to be looking forward together um, as August comes to a close and thinking about fall. And we have a chat question for today that's about fall. What is something that you are anticipating? So it could be something good, something bad. Um, for me, this is this is kind of quirky, but we have two small apple trees, and this is the first year that I've gotten fruit on one of them, and so I am anticipating that fruit ripening and wondering if any of that will be <laughs> good. I haven't sprayed it, so I'm sure bugs will get at it, birds will get at it. Out of the 20 or so apples that I have on my single apple tree that is fruiting, um, anticipating maybe getting a couple that I can eat um, and, and waiting to see what happens with that. So what about you? What's something you're anticipating as fall approaches? Please sing with me. We're gonna, we're gonna sing a couple songs together. Grace and peace be with you. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm the pastor of Sycamore Creek Church in Potterville. Thank you for joining us today for our online worship. I'm glad that you are with us. We're continuing today in our series, People of the Light. And as we talk about that light, well, the light always starts with God and with focusing on God. And we have a worship practice that helps us to do this. I'm going to invite you at this time in the worship service to go and get a candle and to take that candle and to light it as an act of worship, a reminder that God is present with us. God's light is present with us as we worship. Uh, I'm gonna light my candle right here and I invite you at this time to light your candle at home. Today we look to the light of this candle as a reminder of God's presence with us. As we look to God's presence, will you join me in prayer? 
And God, we thank you for your presence with us. We look to you, God, as the leader in our lives. We pray, God, that, that we, we wouldn't be selfish, that we wouldn't be focused on ourselves, but that you would help us to focus on you. We'd hope, help to focus us on following your lead, following your example, following your guide. God, as we, we talk today about being people of the light, help us to follow your light. Help us to do that more closely. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to invite you to continue praying with me as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Please join me in that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today we are continuing in our series, People of the Light. We have Kathy Doby with us. She's a volunteer. She's a member of our vision team. She's a member of our preaching team. And she has a message for us today on the coming of the King. But first, here is our host for today. Hello, my name is Denise Duvall, and I'm your host today. Welcome to Sycamore Creek Church in Potterville. We're glad that you've joined us for worship. I invite you to get connected to Sycamore Creek Church, to take next steps that help you along your faith journey, and to submit your prayer requests. You do all those things through filling out our digital connection card at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connection. Take a moment now to do that. We refer to that connection card again later in the worship service. Connect with us for the first time and we'll send you a free book. We hope today's worship will be impactful and meaningful. If today's worship is helpful for you, take a moment to share it with your friends on social media. You can share the worship service and use our hashtag, hashtag SCC Potterville. Today's message begin with this. Scripture calls us to be light in the darkness. to let our light shine. In the first words written in our New Testament, Paul called a small group of new Christians to be children of the light. 2,000 years later, the first letter to the Thessalonians still offers powerful guidance for us today as we live as people of the light. For many years, I led a small group of women in a Bible study group. We called ourselves the Bible Babes. In that time, we did dozens of studies together. The following reading is from a homework assignment I gave the group back in August of 2005. What Happens When We Die by Kathy Doby. At the very moment of death of the human flesh, my spirit will take wing I believe I will soar light and free, unencumbered by the weight of myself, my body. Like a snake shedding its skin, I'll pull away from this earthly vessel that has bound me and I will feel more like myself than I ever, ever felt before. Weightless, carefree, excited. There'll be a sense of peace and joy, of happiness. I'll be free of pain and hurt and sadness. I'll be completely surrounded and wrapped in love. I will feel safe and protected. I'll be aware of my surroundings. I will know how and why I died, but I will be unafraid. I will not judge. I will not reason. I'll just be. I will see those around me and feel love for them, not worry or concern. I will not feel alone. I will have no concept of time, minutes, hours, days. So I'm not sure how quickly I will ascend to heaven, 
I'll be ready to go, but if it's my choice, I may want to linger it for a while for my family to try and comfort them in their time of sorrow. You know, be a presence that I think they'll be able to feel. And when it's time for me to meet Jesus, I will, I will instinctively know where to go and how to get there. It'll be an awesome journey flying through starlit universes behind our little world. The lights, the colors, the sounds will be dazzling. All my sadness will be heightened beyond anything I've ever experienced. There'll be no fear, no regrets. And when I arrive in heaven, I'll be greeted by many loved ones, friends who have gone before waiting for me and know I'm coming. My grandmas will be among the first to greet me, along with my great grandmas who I never met on earth. What an overwhelming joy it will be to see their faces again, not aged, but youthful and healthy. And all the saints who've gone before me will be cheering my arrival. I'll know them, they'll know me. It'll be a celebration, music and laughing, tears of happiness, no sadness. The surroundings are beautiful, unlike anything on earth in appearance. And when I bow before Jesus' feet, it will be as someone who is returning home after a long, long time. He'll be familiar to me and I, I'll know him. He'll be my friend. He'll know my heart and I'll tell him I love him and ask him to forgive me for any mistakes I made while I was on earth. And he will say, it's already done. You serve me well. He'll hug me and tell me he's proud of me. I'll spend eternity forever praising God and welcoming the friends and family who come after me. My name is Kathy Doby, and I'm a partner at Sycamore Creek Church and a volunteer in the teaching and worship and vision teams. I don't remember what that study was about now, but clearly we were talking about the afterlife and what happens at the moment of death, when we breathe out that last breath of air. Today we are in the beautiful garden at Pray Funeral Home, which is fitting for this sermon. And I want to thank the Pray family for allowing us to be here today. We are in the midst of a sermon series called People of the Light, based on a series by Adam Hamilton, the pastor of the Church of Resurrection. We've been exploring uh, the New Testament book, called 1 Thessalonians, that's in the New Testament. It was Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica. It's believed to be among the first Christian literature in existence, written just 20 years after Jesus' death and 20 years before the first gospel was written. We learned from Pastor Mark in the first message of the, of the series, the mechanics of how Paul went about writing this letter on papyrus paper. And it was a very short book, the equivalent of about two typed eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper in length. And today the message is, is called the coming of the King, the second coming of Christ. We're talking deep stuff here. We're gonna explore what happens when we die as it's recorded in Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica. Paul was writing to a, a small community of Christians who had started the church in Thessalonica with him. Paul had only been there a short time when he when he had to, he was forced to leave by the opposition. He fled in the night under the cover of darkness before he could be arrested. But some of the other church leaders were arrested and taken in. They were allowed to leave after being questioned and they were released. Well, let's just pause there for a second and think about that. Sit on that idea that you could start a church and be arrested for doing it. That's difficult for us to fathom such a thing in this day and age, even though there are still places in the world in 2023 where it's dangerous to be a Christian. You're proclaiming a belief in Jesus Christ could cost you your life in certain areas. And it leads us to this first chat question. Take a moment, think about it, ask someone around you this question. Have you ever been in a situation or place where you felt uncomfortable or even unsafe because of your faith?
Paul is writing from the road to encourage the church of Thessalonica. Paul was sort of a church hopper, but actually he was more of a church planter. Paul would start a church and get it going, and then he'd move on to another place and start another church. The letter that was written was during his stay in Corinth. And he'd write the Corinthians a couple of letters too, eventually. But in fact, most of the New Testament is made up of letters and many of them were written by Paul. Paul was uh, concerned and worried about the welfare of the people in Thessalonica, their physical well-being, but also their mental and emotional and spiritual well-being and whether they would be able to keep the faith in the face of all the persecution they were, they were under. He sent his associate, Timothy, to go and check on the people in Thessalonica. Timothy goes and then he meets up with Paul in Corinth to give them the report. And it's good news. The Thessalonians are doing well. They're hanging in there. They're still following Jesus despite the criticism and accusations and threats they're under. Timothy reported that not only were they still faithful to the cause of Christ, but they're actually living out the gospel. Paul's letter to them begins with praise for their faithfulness and words of encouragement and gratitude for their not giving up. Then midway through chapter 4 at verse 13, Paul shifts gears. He goes from writing about living a life that pleases God, you know, staying away from sexual immorality, controlling your body and not mistreating a brother or sister, but loving them and, you know, living a quiet life and minding your business and earning your way. He goes from this sort of practical advice straight to the topic of death and grieving. You know, where'd that come from? We have to wonder if uh, you know, Timothy had shared with Paul some questions that people were having or, or if there'd been maybe a loss of someone in the church, perhaps someone very dear and that Paul knows the church is grieving. Whatever the reason, Paul writes to them in chapters four and five about what happens when we die? What happens at the end of our physical life and about the second coming of Christ? There's a word for this, eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the end of things or the end of life or the world. And it's in this first letter to the Thessalonians that we find the most detailed explanation of the second coming of Jesus by Paul. And as we break down verses 413 through 514 on Paul's teaching on grief, I want to invite you to follow along in your Bible or by taking some notes. Paul starts out with this, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about people who have died so that you won't mourn like others who don't have any hope. Notice he doesn't tell them not to mourn. Paul understands and he wants them to understand too that grieving is a natural part of the human experience. In fact, the deeper the love we have for a person, the deeper the grief we feel at the loss of that person. His advice is important because in those days, the Roman Greco world did not have a lot of hope. Many people did not believe in any kind of afterlife and those who did thought it was only for the very, very good or the very, very bad. There was little or no hope for all the average people. Paul told the church that they were a people with hope because Christ rose from the dead, and that meant that they too would also rise from the dead. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose, so we also believe that God will bring with him those who have died in Jesus. Now, Paul must have anticipated that there would be more questions because he he goes on in chapter four to address how and when this resurrection of the dead would happen. Questions like, would Christ call to the living and the dead be at the same time? Would, when he returns, are, are the dead just asleep, waiting for Christ's return? You know, what are the dead doing right now? Maybe some of you have those same questions, pondered those same things. I know since my parents' death, I've often thought about that. You know, what is mom doing right now? Paul tells them, what we're saying is a message from the Lord. We who are alive and still around at the Lord's coming definitely won't go ahead of those who have died. This is because the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the signal of a shout by the head angel and a blast of God's trumpet. For those who are 
dead in Christ will rise, then those who are living and still around will be taken up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. That way, we will always be with the Lord. And as for the timing of all this, Paul says, we don't need to write to you about the timing and the dates, brothers and sisters. You know very well that the days of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. Paul assures them that as children of light, children of the day, they will not be caught by surprise because of their faithfulness and love, they are protected. They're ready. They'll not suffer God's wrath because they have salvation through Jesus. Then Paul gives them a final instruction, which includes a call to action. Live in peace with each other, brothers and sisters. We urge you to warn those who are disorderly, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Wow, that's good advice. That's really good advice. And Paul said it was a, a message from God. But I would think his background and his understanding of the Jewish beliefs and traditions probably informed his thinking too. You have to remember that Paul was, uh, was of Jewish descent. He, he'd been a Jewish leader, a keeper of the law, who'd persecuted Christians until his conversion. He was taught, as all Jews were taught, and, and the early Christians too, that when you died, you went to a place known as the realm of the dead. Sounds a little bit like the title of a blockbuster thriller to me. And actually, it is the name of a, a popular PlayStation game. You'll be relieved to know that there's only moderate violence in the realm of the dead, according to Sony. The realm of the dead was believed to be a place of waiting. It, it could be a wonderful paradise for those who are good, or a terrible place of torture called Hades for those who were not. Paradise was thought to be like a king's garden with flowing fountains and exotic foods and animals, just like an earthly king would have, with God as the king who, who rules over this garden. We hear that word paradise to describe the afterlife in a few places in the Bible, maybe most notably by Jesus himself when he was dying on the cross. He spoke it to one of the two thieves hanging on the tree next to him. I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. Wow, what a promise. Hades was also referred to as Gehenna, was a place where people go to pay for their sins that they committed while they were on earth. And most of us, if we were taught anything at all about an afterlife, we've heard about heaven and hell. And there are all kinds of ideas and beliefs and schools of thought on the topic. We don't have enough time to cover it all. But it is a good place to pause and consider a question. Think about this. What were you taught to believe about an afterlife, if anything, when you were growing up? Take a few minutes and talk about it.
Many people have the opinion that hell is not a place that God sends people to or sentences people to because of their sin or mistakes, but rather hell is a choice freely made. Still others maintain that life, this life, is heaven or hell. We're living it now, depending on our circumstances, from the choices we make. Again, choice is important. I will concede that our choices can certainly make this life feel like heaven on earth or make our life a living hell. C.S. Lewis, a Christian writer and author, once said, the doors of hell are locked from the inside. Scripture does not end at the realm of the dead, thankfully. That's not the end of the story. The Bible goes on to talk about a second coming of Christ, that he will come again and judge the living and the dead. We should all be pretty well-versed in this after a month-long sermon series this past June on the Nicene Creed. Remember that ancient statement of faith that we studied in the series called Hope For Us? Yeah, the Nicene Creed was created in the 300s by the Council of Nicaea to answer the questions on who God is and what God does. It defines our Christian beliefs in the triune God and in the church in accordance with Scripture. We claim belief in one Lord, Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven for our salvation and he became man through the birth of the Virgin Mary, that he was crucified for our sake and suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day. And then this, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We're a people of hope, a people of light. We don't mourn like those who have no hope because we have hope in the risen Christ. Through him and through his sacrifice, we have hope and a promise for eternal life. Why do we believe that Christ will come again? How can we be so sure? Because he said he would. He said he would. In Matthew 16, the chapter where Jesus predicts his death to his disciples and, and Peter boldly says, no, 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 Lord, not you. This will never happen to you. What was Jesus' response? Remember, he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble for you're not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. It's in the same chapter, Matthew 16, verse 27, that Jesus talks to them about his return, about his second coming. And he says, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Jesus tells them that they won't know when it will happen, but to expect some terrible things to happen first. So stay alert. Now, Jesus often told his followers stories or parables to prepare them for things and to help them better understand uh, what he was saying in his teachings. He did this for the, for the judgment day, too, in Matthew 25, when he told them about the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Then all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll fit the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And in the book of Revelation, the final chapter of the New Testament, Jesus has the last word, and it's a promise. The one who bears witness to these things says, Yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus said, I'll be back long before Arnold ever did. We know this is important information, a message from God, as Paul said, because it's included in all of the important Christian creeds, including the Nicene Creed. But mostly, we know it is important because Jesus promised it. So it must be the gospel truth. Still, the question lingers, what about our loved ones who passed on before Jesus? What about them? What, what happens to us, too, when we die? Will the dead miss out on Christ's second coming? What is really going to happen? How will all this play out? We want to know. Let's just focus on what we do know. We do know from Paul's letter, chapter 4, the Lord will come down from the heaven with a trumpet, blasting and raising the dead first, 
and then all who were still living would be taken up and join them in the clouds. Paul describes it as a glorious appearance of God coming in the clouds with great shouts of acclamation and archangels with them and all believers caught up in the air. Certainly is a powerful image. The idea that we will be caught up comes from the Latin word raptus, which describes overwhelming excitement. And it's where the word rapture comes from. The idea of being gathered up and rising up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This all sounds a bit bizarre to our way of thinking and rationalizing things. We're thinking with human thoughts, not God's thoughts. This is in large part due that we don't talk about this much in the, in the mainline churches. The more charismatic churches talk frequently about Christ's return. They, they take a great deal of time to review it and examine it and preach it. The preachers and teachers in these churches preach it regularly and, and correlate the stories they see on the daily and the nightly news with the predictions in the book of Revelations. They create timeline charts and chronologies of the last days, and they promote that we are living in the last days right now. That Christ might come at any moment, and he might. We don't know. Pastor Adam Hamilton said that in the Pentecostal church that he grew up in, the pastor would close every sermon with, if I don't see you next week, I'll see you in the clouds. Now this is why those old classic church songs like I'll Fly Away and Soon and Very Soon, This World is Not My Home, are so beloved. And I love them too. Perhaps a more contemporary example is a song called Where I Belong by the Christian band Building 429. The chorus says, All I know is I'm not home yet. This is not where I belong. Take this world and give me Jesus. This is not where I belong. Mainline churches like Sycamore Creek Church see this vision that Paul describes more as a metaphor for God's glory, that the image of God as seen in the Bible, which is often through clouds, majestic, magnificent, glorious. It may not be how we will literally experience it, but it is a metaphorical way of talking about someday. When history comes to a close, Christ will return to earth and the world will cease to exist as we know it. It will be the end to evil and a new beginning. We do know from scripture that some things that will have to some things will have to happen before Christ's return. Paul wrote in his second letter to the Thessalonians about an antichrist, the spirit of a man of lawlessness who is a proud, arrogant, deceiving person. And in the last days, Paul said this about the last days, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshiped. So he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. I'm pretty sure each one of us are thinking about someone right now that fits the bill. And we're not all thinking of the same person because there are any number of people who fit this description. Right? Every politician, every sitting president has been touted as the Antichrist. A friend told me during the Reagan Carter election in 1980 that whichever one of them won was the Antichrist. She was absolutely convinced that were, we were in the end days 43 years ago. Paul said there will be a great hardship and adversity, difficulty, and tribulations for seven years before Christ comes. Terrible things happening around the world. Some people think Christ will come first and then there will be seven years of those miserable years for the unfortunates left behind. Authors Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins became household names in the 1990s and early 2000s when they wrote a whole series of books called Left Behind and, and they made, made them into movies too, depicting the end times. Some of you have read those books and watched those movies and been traumatized by them. Seven years of struggle, famine, unimaginable tragedy and hardship. That might describe just about any time in human history. And we think about it, including this one. AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed. You know that there were people then thinking, okay, this must be what Jesus was talking about. 
And what about the Civil War, World Wars I and II, the Holocaust, perhaps the most horrific time in modern day history? Name any wartime in history. Every generation has endured inconceivable atrocities and had people who met the description of the Antichrist in power. So it's understandable that people thought and believed they were in the end times. There's correlation to support anything you want to believe. And this is what leads Christians to follow false religions. Paul gives us two important things to think about and hold on to regarding the second coming of Jesus. First, be ready. Be ready. Be careful. Be vigilant. Stay focused. Keep your eyes on Christ. We want to be alert so, so you're not caught off guard because we don't know when. We also don't focus so much on what's to come that we miss out on what is right in front of us right now. A quote that's been attributed to Oliver Wendell Holmes says, don't be so heavenly minded that you are of no earthly use. Johnny Cash sang a song about that too, it's called No Earthly Good. I take that to mean we shouldn't be so preoccupied on what will happen in the next life that we're unable to enjoy this one that we miss out on opportunities to do good and to love people and live this life to the full. We need to be careful about assuming or accusing anyone of that, of being no earthly use, because it implies that some Christians are so obsessed with the afterlife to the point that they're worthless in this one. And I have never met a Christian who loved God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, who wasn't also doing a lot of wonderful, good work in the world. Be ready. Live a good and faithful life. Love and trust God and treat people well. And the second important thing that Paul gives us is this. Know that the end is not the end. Evil does not get the last word. We are a people of hope, people of light, because we've read, we've read the book. We've read the end of the book and we know love wins. I hope that's not a spoiler for any of you. Love wins. Here's the bottom line. People die every day. It is an inevitable, unavoidable part of life. 150,000 people die every day in the world. We don't know when or where or how it will happen. To us, we only know for sure that it will. We all have an expiration date. Death comes like a thief in the night and one day, one day it will come for us the last day, the end of time for each of us. It's not maudlin' to think about or talk about. It's just fact. But in the meantime, let's live this life one day at a time. Paul gives us a lot to think about, but I also think about a man I spoke to just days before he died. He was a self-proclaimed agnostic, a person who claims neither faith nor disbelief in God. And he asked me to officiate at his funeral. He said, I don't want any fire and brimstone message. No, he's going on to some better place because I don't know that. I'll know when I get there. Indeed, we all will understand it better by and by. And you know, I don't remember now if any of the other Bible babes actually did their homework and wrote a paper about what happens when we die. Probably I'm the only one that did it. But I know that a number of those beautiful ladies are no longer with us 23 years later. And I can only imagine the paper they could write now. I'm not sure what I would, that I would even write the same paper myself as I wrote back in 2005. In fact, looking back on it now, I, I think I may have read one too many accounts on near-death experiences. The only thing missing is the white light. But I do believe it will be something along those lines that my, my spirit, my spiritual being will be released when my physical body gives out. And I will continue to be, to exist beyond this flesh and bones. Of that, I have no doubt. Be ready. Jesus is coming soon, but the end is not the end, only a glorious beginning. Thank you, Kathy. I have a couple quick announcements for us. The first announcement is referred to earlier, a digital connection card. Take a moment and fill that out. Get connected with Sycamore Creek. Take next steps that help you to grow in your faith. Help us to connect with you. You can fill out that digital connection card and, and all the information I sh just shared with you by going to sycamorecreekchurch.org connection. If you do that for the first time, 
We're really grateful for that, thank you. And we have a gift that we'll send you right from Amazon directly to your house. Throughout the month of August, we continue to have our in-person worship services outdoors in our church yard. If you'd love to worship with us, we'd love to have you. And you can bring a blanket or a chair or something to sit on as we gather for intergenerational worship outside in our church yard each Sunday in August. Labor Day weekend, that's Saturday, September 2, and Sunday, September 3, we'll be gathering at our Eastwood campus. We'll be together that night on, on Saturday, September 2 for uh, sharing a meal together. You can bring your own dinner. We'll spend some time hanging out, playing games, uh, roasting s'mores, listening to music. And then Sunday morning, we're gonna gather all together as one campus for a 10.30 a.m. worship service at our Eastwood campus. That's gonna kick off their weekly worship, which is gonna start that Sunday, September 3. I hope to see you there on Sunday, September 3 at 10.30 at our new Eastwood campus. It's all remodeled and it's ready to go for the launch of that new campus this fall. On Sunday, September 10, we will really launch our, our fall schedule at our Potterville campus. We'll be offering Kids Creek again starting September 10. We'll be inside in our sanctuary September 10. And September 10, after worship, you're welcome to stay after worship for a meal. We'll have um, pulled pork sandwiches and chips available. And it's a great time to connect and get to know, better know each other and, and some of the people here at the church. You're welcome to stay after worship on Sunday, September 10th. I wanna thank you for your giving that allows us to accomplish the things that our church is able to accomplish. And one of those big things that we accomplished recently is we made a huge difference at our Potterville schools through our back to school bash. This is our most successful back to school bash ever in terms of the number of people who attended, in terms of the number of the backpacks that we passed out. We passed out over 140 backpacks. There were well over 200 people who, who were there and who received Kona ice that night. I want to thank all of our amazing volunteers who helped to pass out those school supplies. I want to thank 21st Century Plastics, one of our community partners, who helped provide money for that back to school bash. And as well, I want to thank all of you for your giving to our Christmas offering. Each year when you give to our Christmas offering, one of the things that it goes toward is local missions. And we were able to make a big difference in preparing for school this fall in our Potterville schools through your giving to the Christmas offering, which then we directed to that back to school bash. Thank you. Here's Kevin with our final worship song.
So today we've talked about the coming of the King. We've talked about the fact that Jesus comes into our world and into our lives. I hope that we've experienced some of that together today. I'm having Jesus in our life in a, in a different sort of way today. And I hope that you'll continue worshiping with us as we continue to study the book of Thessalonians this series. We have one more week of this series, People of the Light. Please join us again next week. Have a great week. Go in peace. Thank you.